Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. You can see me. You can't see Jay. <laughs> Not this week. <laughs> Not this week. Thank you, Skype. Um, the yeah. ever, the ever, um, ever ongoing Skype issues that just creep yeah. up out of the blue. So Jay is Jay that's is okay. Jay's the show calling. Must go on. Jay's calling in today. Exactly. The show goes on. You just get to see one lovely face this week. That's, um, that's, right. that's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, don't ever go see a Minnesota Vikings football game again, Jay. I blame you. Nope, it was their worst performance at home in 30 years, so I'm going to stay away. Stay away from them, please, yeah. for all of, uh, all yep. of us Viking fans yeah. out there. It was, yeah. uh, you know, My we, apologies. We, 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 we have to look at something to blame. You can't blame the team, right? No, no, or the injuries. No, it's it, it's my fault, and uh, I accept responsibility. Um, we'll see what they do um, tonight. They are yeah. playing tonight. They're underdogs, yes, they though. Do, yeah, do, know, yeah. let, let me let me ask you do you do you feel the um, the the what? How would I describe it? The collapse has begun. Well, they've you know not to get too far down in the weeds, but you know with Linval Joseph out and and uh, Anthony Barr and Harrison Smith, uh, they don't have the uh, punch that they had a couple of weeks ago. And until they get those guys back, um, you know it's it's going to be rough going. Yep, I think I think we're beginning the phase that all Viking fans are sadly way too familiar with, where mm-hmm. it just falls apart. But you know, I will say this: I don't think anybody expects him to do this great this season. So, no, the the line, you know, the over under was eight, and they're already there. And look, it's uh, if they can, rebuilding. If, yeah, if they can, if they can build upon this, great. So, anyway, enough yeah. of that. This is not a football podcast. Um, <laughs> we've got a special yeah. guest joining us this week, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating discussion. We are going to yeah. discuss curating playlists, algorithms that go into playlists, how how playlists and 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 online essentials and online greatest hits, those packages yeah. are, are all put together. This is going to be a fascinating discussion. Yeah, it's all about curation and discovery and I think we have the perfect guest um Gary has so much experience in this area and above and beyond that even if he didn't he is passionate uh, about music, and when you get to know Gary, you you know that you can go anywhere. If you want to talk Charlie Parker, if you want to talk uh, Metallica, if you want to talk the Beatles, Cheap Trick, he'll go deep, yep. and he'll go there with you. And it's uh, it's always fun uh, having a cup of coffee uh, with uh, Gary Stewart. So, and that's so, what our listeners get to have this week. Yeah, so I, I encourage you just keep it keep it rolling. Listen to our discussion with Gary Stewart, um, and we'll come back when this is done and have a few parting comments for you. Well, I'd like to welcome Gary Stewart to the show today. Um, I first became aware of Gary when he was with Rhino, uh, Rhino Records, and they were known for a long, long time as uh, putting together the best packages in the business and uh, I, I purchased a lot of those packages and just some awesome, awesome box sets and anthologies and uh, packages. And then I got the pleasure of uh, working with uh, Gary when he moved to uh, Apple, uh, iTunes. And uh, Gary was responsible for all of those great uh, iTunes essentials and iTunes world of and, and just countless, I think there were thousands uh, by the end uh, that were just these great uh, music discovery um, lists of, uh, of music. And I think it really helped those who um, really didn't know an artist that well. They could click on that first tab and get maybe the, uh, the dozen essential songs that they should get to uh, welcome them to the world of that uh, artist. And then you could go a little deeper um, if you wanted to. And it was uh, way ahead of its time because now with all of the streaming services, you know, it's all about uh, curation and discovery, which is kind of the theme of our, uh, our show today. So, uh, Gary, welcome to uh, Music Biz Weekly. It is excellent to be here. Uh, I love your office. I love the accommodations. Oh, wait, I'm in my record room. <laughs> 
which means I like it even better. Seriously, thanks for having me. I listen to your podcast a lot and learn a few things. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, so, I don't know. Where, where do we jump in, Jay? Do we just jump in with the well, big question? How do, how do you start to compile and curate a list, a playlist? Um, well, let's go all over the place with this. Um, sure. uh, it depends upon the kind of list. And, you know, um, uh, Jay said this can be a zigzag conversation. And at some point we should talk about what does curation mean and the big discussion of some people are saying, well, we have the best algorithm. Some people are saying it's man versus machine. So we have the best man or people or humans. Um, so uh, maybe we can get into that through uh, the back door of this question. But to sure. start by answering your question directly, when I do a list um, and when, when I do a playlist, that playlist uh, is, based around, is based around an artist or a genre or something where there is a canon or there's information or context. I have a very specific process that I use. Um, and it's a bit of art, but it's mostly science. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if I were to do, I don't know, let's pick an artist for fun or pick, a, pick an artist for now to illustrate the process. Cheap Elvis trick. Costello. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's say Cheap Trick. I will do Elvis Costello as well eventually. Uh, as you know, he's my favorite artist, so I might be too close to it, but that's a good <laughs> right. as well. Um, right. But when I do Cheap Trick as uh, Cheap Trick or Elvis Costello, um, uh, a lot of people that do curation now will often start with "What do I like? What's my personal taste?" or they'll go to an algorithm um, and just uh, either see what the top downloaded songs are that day or the top downloaded songs are that week. And I think neither is the right way to go because Cheap Trick, an artist with uh, a canon in context and a bit of a skewed perspective if you just take the algorithm. So with Cheap Trick, mm -hmm. I would start with, let's take a look at AirPlay. I think AirPlay is probably the best tool um, to start with because AirPlay tells you how something is sitting in the culture now. So I will take that list. Then I'll look at chart positions just to show, just to see how those songs impacted um, the first time they were around. Those can be misleading, but you want to make sure you don't miss anything. Um, right. Uh, then the next thing I'll look at is what's Cheap Trick playing in their sets? Then I'll look at Cheap Trick now has, uh, you know, five different box sets or greatest hits and what's on there. So what's considered part of the canon? Then I'll look at maybe go on blogs and see what uh, the pace of the Rolling Stones have said the greatest Cheap Trick songs are. Um, I'll look to see what was covered. Um, I will look to see what kind of behavior Cheap Trick's taken, taken uh, part in. For example, you know, they regularly play their first three albums in their entirety, uh, which means that those records which were kind of ignored at the time are underappreciated. Certainly the first two have more meaning. Um, and right. um, I will start the list with all of those, especially when you're doing a... Uh, uh, an essential or a basic or you want to kind of give somebody the first date, I will use as much science as possible. Uh, then the, the last thing I may do once I craft that list is call up somebody like Jay Gilbert, who's a, 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 a hardcore Cheap Trick fan, and call a couple Jay Gilberts. We're going to get cloning going. Um, <laughs> to find out, what do you think of this list? What am I missing? Um, and those discussions are both rich and difficult because the discussion Jay, you and I'll have is God, we love this song. Come on, come on from in color. That's the greatest. You got to have that on there. Um, and that's where I'll stop and say, well, we love it, but that doesn't mean that it should be on there because we love it because it hasn't earned itself in context or cultural canon, or it hasn't made a footprint. That's where we kind of have to be disciplined, but you may go, Hey, why isn't ELO kitties or why isn't, uh, um, I want you to want me on there if it isn't, which it probably would be, just to make sure that we're bringing in the, the passionate fan, the knowledge, and the expertise, if only to ask questions uh, where the answer is no, despite our taste, we want right. it. Right. 
Um, so right. And if I can just add something to that, Gary, you know, I you think it's important do. to note. <laughs> I think it's important to note that one of the things that um, I thought was very uh, exciting and compelling about when you were with Apple is that you did just that. There were times where you would have a playlist uh, for an artist and you would say, you know, what do you think? You know, is there something we're missing? Is there something that you think should be on here uh, that isn't? And people could send you, I, I, I seem to remember a power pop one that you did and, you know, some other ones where you could actually send the input and see it, you know, added to the playlist if it made sense. And I think that's something that in today's world is lacking because, you know, you and I talked about a cheap trick playlist that I saw online and they opened the playlist up with going to raise hell, you know, which is this, you know, I don't know how many minutes it is, six, seven minute song. And it just kind of set the tone for the whole playlist. And I felt like if I had that kind of input that you always had, where people could actually talk to you and suggest things, uh, you know, that sort of thing wouldn't happen. Um, yeah, those playlist changes, um, there were a number of cheap trick playlists. And um, I think that, um, I think the question about gonna race hell is not only does it belong in there, but where does it belong in there? And we'll get into sequencing. And uh, I think the thing yeah. you want to do, and we look at a cheap trick playlist, and I think you went after me when I did the playlist on iTunes, is to have mm -hmm. the discussion to make sure, oh, do you have the live version of I Want You to Want Me? Because that was the hit. Uh, and that's the one that people know. Do we have enough songs from the first three or four albums which they play in their entirety? Are, on the other hand, are we making sure that we include... Um, uh, ain't that a shame, or at least check out Don't Be Cruel and decide, well, that was sort of cheap trick trying to have a hit, but they did. Uh, then the next question you, we, we both asked is, uh, does In the Street belong in there? It certainly did in 2005, because that 70s show was still prominent in the culture. I think it still is. That had to right. be on there. Um, so we asked two questions about what needed to be on there um, and then where it belonged. Now, Gonna Raise Hell is something that sort of percolates its way into some of their live shows. It's sort of considered their exemplar of their jamming tendency. Our question was, where does it belong? Uh, but the important yeah. thing about the discussion wasn't whether I'm right or you're right. It was that we had the discussion and that we regularly asked it for, for purposes of challenging ourselves rather than making sure we were engaging in personal taste or they were, we were missing something out. We didn't just go, I like that. I don't like that. And that's the important point I want to make about curation is at its best, it's understanding um, uh, not just how you like something. I think that's the most dangerous place to go. It's understanding uh, how important something is, um, what it means to the band, what it means to the fans and whether it should be part of somebody's first meeting, get to know introduction connection with. Um, and yeah. that's the difference between, hey, here's a great list I like, or here's songs I like that, that you'll go after. One thing that we should talk about is we're now living in an era where, especially with artists from the last 10 years, there aren't greatest hits for the most part. There are very few greatest hits. Um, and the playlist has supplanted greatest hits. And playlists from trusted sources like online music services and other blogs are going to continue to supplant greatest hits. So that when you're doing something, you may replace both the existing greatest hits and you be, may be defining the canon. And you don't want to do that with personal taste. Um, one thing I said on a panel at South by Southwest is, because the purpose of the panel is, can curation uh, save the music industry? And... Um, mm -hmm. That topic was sort of our way of saying, well, it can, but you need human beings like us, and we're so important, and don't put us out of business with machines. And one thing I said right away was, I would rather take uh, an algorithm over somebody just sitting in a room and picking their favorites. I think that, you know, the, the, the Interesting. version, I would rather take a machine yeah. than somebody's personal taste. Um, 
that was a way of, of illustrating that when you use extremities, you're not doing anybody a favor on either end. There are sometimes where algorithms and, and online information is really good. Uh, uh, and you want to use that. You don't want to ignore that. There's times where somebody's knowledge and maybe even their taste in combination with a number of people that are fans can be helpful. But if you don't use either one carefully like a tool, you're going to end up uh, either misrepresenting history, not connecting somebody with a quality experience, and not becoming a trusted source. Because really, that's what it's all about. I also think you're going to see online services playlists replace greatest hits in an even more profound way. So that's uh, more of an incitement to be uh, responsible and careful and get your ego out of the way. Gary, Gary right. let, let, me, let me ask you. So all of this is really interesting and makes sense to me, but does, does, the, does the direction of how you approach creating this playlist follow one of the two basic things where I'm creating a playlist that has to be an essentials, which I, I, I sort of look at essentials as the same thing as greatest hits. These are the songs you have to have versus a playlist for an artist that is about discovering the tracks that didn't bubble up, meaning you could take Cheap Trick as an example again, and all of that criteria you talked about, airplay and downloads and sales and all of that, that's going to talk about the popular songs. But if you want to put together a playlist that is, well, you know what, here's the, here's the, the, the deep cut that never got airplay, but it's really good, that to me is a discovered song. Does it, are, are you following what I'm saying here? I mean, you're, I'm it's, following it's, exactly what you're saying. <laughs> And I think you're asking, excuse me, <clears throat> the perfect question. Um, because what we did at Essentials, where we had three levels, we had basics, next steps, and deep cuts, and we walked you down the continuum. <clears throat> Sorry about that. We walked you down the Sorry. continuum so that you could have that discovery opportunity. But we, we were of the mind, and I'm still of the mind, that if you don't start somebody on a Beach Boys list, for example, with good vibrations um, or surf and safari, you aren't going to earn the trust to walk them down to something sure. like surf's up or one of the more interesting Brian Wilson Van Dyke parks discussion. If you want somebody to hear, come on, come on, which ended up on deep cuts. Um, and you don't start with, um, I want you to want me or surrender. Um, or you don't have what people expect. If you don't have their version of in the street, why should they trust you? Um, you want to establish that, that you agree on certain things and when they come somewhere, they get what they expect. Or even if they don't, they, they might vaguely remember some of these songs until, and they might vaguely remember some of these songs. They click on them, they check them out and go, Oh yeah, that's the cheap trick. I know. I love this. They're right. They get it then you've created a foundation of trust and discovery. See, what I'm trying yeah. to do is, you know, we should talk about why we need curators is because we grew up in a world of great rock writers and DJs and most importantly, record store clerks, uh, the good kind, the functional kind that said, oh, you like this? Let me help you go deeper. And you can't do that until you agree with the person. The, the example I always use is I think we've both seen High Fidelity. And we mm -hmm. remember that great scene in the movie and in the book where um, somebody comes in and says, do you have Stevie Wonder's uh, I Just Called to Say I Love You? And Jack Black says, we do, but that's sentimental garbage. And uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Get out of there. What good curation does is, is doesn't say, Oh, forget about, uh, I just called to say I love you and check out uh, this, the B-side of Fingerprints. The, the good curation says, of course we have it. That's a good song. That's exactly where you should be. And while you're here, have you heard these other things by Stevie Wonder? Do you know um, Sign, Seal, Deliver? Do you know the best tracks on inner visions or songs in the key of life? And that person will probably say yes. Mm -hmm. If not, then you know what they need. Then once they do that and said, um, have you heard the single from 1966 that's been covered by these five modern artists? 
Uh, and then once you've done that, you might say, and I really love this song. I think you're going to like it. But if you don't start with common knowledge, if you don't start with agreement and you get esoteric, um, you're going to be letting a lot of people down. And, and on most online curation services, and there aren't a lot, they will usually have something that replicates the basic level, and then they will go to a deep cuts or discovery list. But even that discovery list uh, should not be, in my mind, somebody's personal taste. It should be a number of people that are fans. Uh, also, few artists, when you get beyond 15, don't have objective information about what those deep cuts are. It's not your favorites. You want to be very careful with that. When we did deep cuts at um, uh, on, uh, on the essentials list, we used uh, research as well. We found things that uh, were the you know, 20th or 30th most, do most downloaded songs, singles that didn't chart. And then we get on the phone with two or three Cheap Trick fans and say, what are we missing here? And not only what are we missing, but why? Why is something on there? And the why should almost never be because I have good taste. You really want to be Got careful. It. Got it. Got it. Well, Gary, question? let me ask you something. Or just confuse um, you for no, that's that's really good. Let me let me ask you something. How how important you look is at, track look at, order to you? Well, uh, track order is really important, uh, and understand that when we did essentials, there was no such thing as track order, uh, because essentials were not sold as entire playlists for the most part. Um, you could purchase a certain level, but even if you did they might not migrate in that order, but most people that were using that feature and, and we're, we're in a different place with playlists and streaming, but in, in the downloads world, essential right. more or less had to be, you had to rank them in order because most customers would click on the song and uh, go, I want to buy that, or I'd like to buy these five or these three or these four so you had to literally walk people through it like it was a bin of singles or songs and hoping they would buy as many as possible and hoping they would go further with you. So if you look at those and they're not around, they were sequenced as an enticement and an, an evangelism as a, uh, a seduction. And the goal was always getting people to go further. If you only wanted one song and you bought two or three well, then that's yeah. a victory. And I don't mean just a commercial victory. I think, Jay, what you and I are always trying to do is we love people to own 15 Cheap Trick albums, or I'd love people to get into later period Elvis Costello. But if you can move sure. them a few notches further than where they are toward a deeper engagement, toward where, where music has more meaning, then mm -hmm. you really serve the art and uh, the culture and the listener and the consumer and deepen their relationship with artists, uh, with that artist, and you've deepened their relationship with music in general. I mean, um, just to go off on a slight tangent, yeah. um, there was that article, was it from Ethan Kaplan? Was that his name? Yeah. Yes. Where he, you know, listed things he, he hated people mouthing very uh, emptily, we hated people mouthing empty platitudes at the, about the music business. And one was saying people really care about music and his, him saying, well, that's not true. And he didn't mean it in a wholly cynical way. He was saying, you can't assume that everybody or even most people want to move beyond music as a background experience. Um, yeah. uh, and that made me sad at first, but that, it's always been my mission, mission that if you want to move people from background to foreground, you explain why something's important. You do a really good job creating the information, the context, um, uh, providing the passion, uh, the knowledge, explaining not just what, but why, the way you graphically design it, the way you use those two or three limited lines that you have online. And you might move that person somewhere along the continuum. And that's um, what I'm yeah. guessing has happened with all three of us. Certainly you and me, Jay, we started out yeah. listening to you going, I like that song. And somebody uh, came to something inside us and said, this could mean so much more. You could have a deeper relationship. But it doesn't often happen naturally. It doesn't happen passively. And that uh, item in Ethan's article wasn't meant as a cynical pronouncement, but a challenge saying, don't just assume that people should like what you like or like it the way you like it. Um, 
do the work, serve the form. We yeah. aren't creators. We don't make music. We don't write songs. We don't produce it. So it's our job to be evangelists. It's our job to make music mean for, to make music and, mean. And Gary, how, how do you do that now? I mean, when you used to put together box sets, you could put together a beautiful booklet that could tell a story that was awesome. Then you moved to digital and with your time uh, when you were putting together these at Apple, you could do it in a different way. How can we, how can you do it today? How do you get that story across? Um, you know what I mean? When you, you have this passion and you have this story behind this music that you know would, that people could connect to, um, how do you do that in the streaming world? Um, well, you're writing a really good haiku instead of writing a novel. That's a different kind of challenge. Um, and it was frustrating for me at times. But look, those box sets exist. And guess what? Those box sets exist online. And that if you want to know more about an artist, there's Wikipedia, there's myriad blogs, there's information, there's fan sites. So that's all available to you if you want it. Mm -hmm. If you don't do, do a good job writing that haiku, <clears throat> if you don't use those three or four lines to get somebody excited to provide the right information, not an obscure fact about the band history, um, uh, and not just a piece of, of sort of self-important puffery or, or aggrandizement where you're like Chris Farley on the show going, well, that's awesome, using these sort of empty superlatives um, if you can find that middle ground that's not nerdism and uh, arcane, uh, arcane information on one hand or empty boosterism on the other and find something that is like a poem that's, that's, that's not superficial, but there are music in the words, well, then you're going to get people connected with that music and they're going to go online and they're going to create their own box set and their deeper experience. And I think that's where... I'm interested in going. I think that's where everybody else is interested in going rather than back to how do we get those things that sit on a coffee table? Um, uh, yeah. The, yeah. the sort of loss is that you don't have the, the book with the pictures, but I think many people didn't engage with those in the first place. It was there for the hardcore fans and fanatics and you were illustrating that you did the work. I think with uh, the, the, the challenges of the, of the modern world, there are greater opportunities because you do a good job. People, again, can walk down that continuum and have a relationship they want. It's your job to make sure that first, second, and third date is a rich experience that changes their understanding, the way they see music, the way they see the relationship with music, or the way they connect with that artist. Gary, I've, I've, got, I've got two I don't know. They might be basic questions. Um, first one is, as a curator, how difficult is it to put together one of these 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 playlists for an artist that you're not passionate about? Um, that's where you really want to do your best work. It's it is it's difficult uh, if you don't know the artist or love the artist but that's where you want to overcompensate and do right by that artist's work. Uh, that's where you want to bring in other experts. And that's, again, why if you use chart information and blogs and you access knowledge and understanding and get the context right, uh, and you find fans or passionate people to sort of color the end results, you're not going to have a problem. In some ways, the best work is done where you have to make the case for somebody that you don't have a deep relationship with or even like. That's, for me, where the excitement happens. You owe artists that you dislike more than you owe an artist that you're fanatic about. Um, and that happened regularly. It, ha it happened when we did packages at Apple. It happened when we did Essentials uh, uh, at Apple. And that was where we went out of our way to make sure that a fan of that artist or that genre was going to feel that we got it. I, I won't name names, but there are a couple of artists that came up to me who I, you know, I didn't hate. I just wasn't a fan of. And they said, I love what you did. And I love the way you chose the, the deeper cuts. You did such a good job. And that was more important to me 
than hearing from an artist I like that I got them. Uh, that's why, again, that's why curation is work and it's a craft and it's a bit of an art form and not just a scientific <laughs> exercise, not an academic exercise, you know, and not a personally indulgent exercise. So that's a great question. And, so and, and I, I say this because I think if you want to trust the source, you want to know that they make the sausage this way and that it's more like a fine gourmet meal than just something that's yeah. a commodity to be consumed. And, 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 and second question, which follows up on that, how much time would you spend putting together one of these playlists? You know, I have to think, I never measured it. It could be hours. I mean, they were never put together in one short session. You would come up with a first draft, bounce it around, think about it. Um, some might have taken hours and some might have been uh, put together in a much shorter period of time. I mean, the way you the way you make it work is that you spend more time in the things that you don't know, being humble and getting the information, um, and you pay for that with artists that you know like the back of your hand, you have easy information, uh, uh, there's so much chart history, and one of the things we didn't talk about is, uh, Cheap Trick is, that, is a perfect example, because they're not an artist with no hits, and they're not an artist with um, uh, like 20 or 30 hits where you can get the obvious 15, like a Bruce Springsteen or a Madonna. I mean, it takes no work right. to come up with a Madonna essential. It takes work to sequence it right, to, to kind of use the science. Uh, even the deep cuts are agreed upon because they are the lesser hits. Um, it, it, on the other hand, it isn't an artist like Big Star where there are only two or three songs that are acknowledged and you have to figure out where what are played at the reunion shows, what made it onto the greatest share. Sure. There's no chart history. Cheap Trick have a bit of both. They have five or six songs that have to be on there. Uh, a lot of things that we love. And if you dig deeper, you're going to find, well, there is some objectivity. There are songs like Hello Kitties. Uh, there are songs... Um, uh, um, uh, like a dream police or um, perhaps way of the world that have become hits or fan favorites or standards, but you're not going to find them in an obvious way. That's where it gets interesting. Right. Have, have you ever right. had um, input or have you reached out and gotten input from the artists themselves when putting together these lists? Um, we didn't do that a lot. Um, and it's not to disrespect the artist, and you want them to feel good about it. Um, but an artist is often not the best judge of their own work. Um, often they are. And an artist, you're already getting input from an artist anyways when you're looking at their set list, when you're looking what they allow on their greatest hits. But often an artist will uh, exclude from a best of, or uh, this is back in the physical world, uh, will exclude a hit because they decide they don't like it or they're kind of embarrassed by it. And you leave that off, well, a fan that that like that artist or wants to know about them, they shouldn't have that hit uh, excluded. Also, an artist can often say, well, I prefer a live version of that. And they may be right, but then you're kind of denying what somebody else's experience or you're denying what a community or culture or society's experience of that song is. Um, so yeah. I, I, I really, my goal is always to have the artist think you work really hard to represent and connect me with both my fans, but even more importantly, the people that are either casual listeners, uh, that are on their way to becoming deeper fans or fanatics. But the number one person that I serve is the customer and the listener, because that's where Got I it. Um, I, I'm sure we've all had experiences where we got a box set or we got a best of when we, we weren't nerds and couldn't buy everything and couldn't get something online and a favorite was missing and not just a favorite album cut, but a song that we heard on the radio and wonder what mm -hmm. was going on. What often happens, by the way, and I've seen this um, with some of my favorites that, that were excluded from a greatest hits or best of is those end up coming back on the box set or the greatest hits when the artist kind of relents and says, you know, I'm kind of over my sure. individual experience of that song and get that this is important to people. 
So it's, it's yeah, and I noticed Gary, like, you know, when I, I worked out. for um, when when I worked for a record company and, and helped to put together a couple of uh, compilations, uh, a couple of my my favorite artists, you learn quickly that it's not always about curation. There are other you know financial reasons. Maybe they want to make sure that there's an equal number of uh, publishing uh, songs for each of the key songwriters and things like that that you don't have to worry about when you put together um, your playlist. But that, that brings me to a, something that we talk about uh, pretty often, and some people have pretty strong opinions about it. And, and you and I have spoken about this a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about uh, playlists that are built uh, by algorithm versus human creation and those that use both. Are, are algorithms um, inherently inaccurate or bad, or are they something that you would use yourself at some point to maybe help begin to build a list? Not only would I use them, but I do use them. I think they're uh, uh, overall inherently good. I think they're not just, you know, this robot and this, you know, sort of Orwellian machine. They're based upon other people's information, which means they're based upon their taste, which means they collect in a data-driven way human emotions. And I think to reject them wholesale, as I, as I said earlier, is almost worse than not including them. And sometimes they, uh, when you want to use a recommendation playlist or you want somebody to say, here's my taste. Um, what do I do with this? Algorithms are probably the best place to go. That's why people are spending millions of dollars and hours trying to get them right. Um, uh, I think it'd be reactionary to reject them. I think when yeah. it comes to, to somebody not having existing knowledge, there's a difference between saying, hey, I want to hear some good new music or I want a playlist for a party, or I want a workout list, uh, then you want to take the science of what works in a workout, what works in an atmosphere, how that sequencing is done. Algorithms uh, are probably somewhere between really strong and spot on. When you want an introduction to reggae, or you want an introduction to electronica, um, and you just use a playlist, you're going to miss things because there just isn't enough data or information. Now in 10 years, algorithms may be able to do everything. I don't think so, but it's certainly possible um, because they will gather a larger sample of behavior and knowledge. But all of those things we talked about, blogs, set lists, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cultural touchstones, those aren't all in the machine yet. They might be, and algorithms might be the way to go. And algorithms are just going to keep getting better and better. I don't think they'll ever replace the need for somebody to kind of come in and say, let's explain context. Again, algorithms are only good also for making a list. And making a list and sequencing, those are, the, those are, those are some of the most important aspects of any curation. But yeah. the next question, that's the what. The next question is the why. Algorithms can't write copy for you. Algorithms can't have an event. Uh, algorithms can't have people talking about this playlist in public. Um, um, and what you want to do is take the best of that technology, and it's very good, and then find a way to create meaning and community and passion and experience. I can see a, uh, a world coming really soon where um, people find a way in clubs or in public spaces uh, to talk about these lists, or people find a way to say, an artist can say, I'm going to do this playlist from this service um, uh, and give it meaning and give it life. Um, and, and as you know, I always say that science uh, empowers art and art is empowered by meaning and context and excitement. And that, that for yeah. me, that's the challenge that, that, uh, uh, I want us all to be working on. Gary, is there an artist that you, 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 you know, as a curator, have you discovered an artist through creating a list where you were done and going, wow, I've, I am now a fan. I like this artist where beforehand they just were not on your radar. There was never an instance where I had to work on a list. And often I would have other people work on a list 
when I had to dig deeper that I didn't come to a deeper appreciation. If you put yourself in, if you put effort, and that's the, if you put effort into a relationship with a body of work, you're almost going to come out with a deeper appreciation and understanding. Even if it's something you thought you hated, it's highly unlikely you'll walk out without a deeper level of interest or empathy or understanding unless you're just so obstinate. And, and that's another example of why getting a list right and creating meaning and going for why over what is so important because I want everybody to be more into everything or to have a deeper understanding of why they like something or why they don't like something. I will answer your question in, in a more um, uh, uh, difficult way is Sometimes I heard music that I already liked and came to an understanding that it was dated, that it was less relevant, or it only spoke to me at that one time and that I understood. Um, for me, it's weaknesses uh, in, in the present day or in terms of where my psyche was. That happened very rarely. More importantly, uh, it helped me understand things that didn't connect with me for. But I think it's important to you know, not just go, I'm going to like everything or, uh, but even worse is I'm going to hate everything. It's important to develop a sense of aesthetics, criteria, deeper. And you can only do that if you have people helping you out and treating you um, like you're going to be somebody that has a deeper relationship. How many people did Apple have working on putting together these lists? Um, well, you mean then, in, in, then, in a sense, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we used over the course of, uh, putting essentials together about a hundred people, but they weren't a hundred and people are probably thinking, well, they hired a hundred people. That's incredible. We treated compiling like mission impossible. The TV show treated that week's episode. Uh, sometimes you'd want the genre expert slash the amphibious expert. Sometimes you'd want somebody. <laughs> right. There were people that there were people among those hundred people, probably 50 of those people only did one or two lists. Um, there were 10 or 20 people that did tens, if not hundreds of lists. Um, uh, if I had to reduce it to a body count, I couldn't. It's not as big as you think. The idea was to create a wealth of knowledge and flexibility and expertise so that you, the consumer, got the best product. When you, um, and I'm sure you do this now, I would assume, when you listen to playlists and see lists on various services, and you don't have to name services if you don't want to, can you tell when somebody is putting in a good effort versus somebody who is just throwing it together? I mean, I can't look at a list and go, that person spent five minutes on it because I'm not in that head. They may have spent more time than I spent on any curation project I did and gotten it wrong, but I can usually tell when somebody is way off base that I can imagine they use personal taste or I can imagine um, that they didn't ask another person. Uh, I'm not inside their head, um, but I can see either um, something that feels frivolous or highly subjective um, or missing some very specific information. I mean, Jay and I have talked about it. We've looked at playlists and said, you know, their third biggest hit is on here, or it covers one decade of their career when they had three decades uh, in a career, and some of those other decades were just them prolonging their artistry, but, uh, but making records and music that had impact and success. Uh, some things are glaringly obvious. Some things are... Uh, a little harder to discern. Usually it's in between. Um, you know, there are very few major crimes, but there are a lot of misdemeanors in there. Let, 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 <laughs> let, let, let me, let me, Jay, would you agree that in our, you know, in our discussion, <laughs> we've kind of seen that? Absolutely. Yeah. G Gary, I mean, clearly what you do is an art. You're an artist. Um, you know, it, it, it takes, it's not just like we talk about. It. It's not just an algorithm. It's not just a computer that does this. But you've got an art to to massaging this and putting these together. If someone were to say, over your career of assembling box sets, essentials, playlists, whatever, what is your greatest piece of art? Which is the one that you are the most proud of putting together? Well, 
let me sort of refute that very nice compliment you gave me, and I'd love to live up to that. But really, at my best, I'm not an artist. I'm a craftsman. And the work I do requires the humility of a craftsman when I do it right. Um, because some of my favorite projects at the time, I look back um, uh, on and think, well, that was great, but I got it wrong because I was too personally close. The DIY series, which uh, covered the first uh, four to five years of punk in the mid to late 70s, is something I was just so excited about the time. And people rave about that still, but there were far too many objective personal choices. My excessive love of power pop uh, crowded out some of the more hardcore and industrial songs that should have been on there. I was fortunate enough to be able to rectify that, and this happened a lot at Rhino. When the box set era came along, we were able to do box surveys. When, when we did the No Thanks box, I was able to have enough uh, distance and, again, humility, bringing in other people mm -hmm. um, to sort of fix my mistakes and get it right. And that's where I became more of a craftsman than an artist. The project that I'm, I'm most proud of is probably... Uh, the Nugget series, and um, uh, especially the second volume, um, because the second volume was the greatest challenge. The second volume, um, the first volume was something where there was a clear canon. The first disc of that was the Lenny K album. The other three discs, well, Rhino had numerous other Nuggets packages. There were myriad garage rock uh, bootlegs. Since Nuggets came out, it, uh, that music had become a genre, and there were numerous articles on what the greatest songs were. Um, so it was much easier to do and to not fall into the, the trap of personal taste. With the second volume of Nuggets, we, ex we went outside the United States because the first box with all the American garage bands and went primarily to England with bits of Australia, um, Denmark, Holland, even a track from Brazil and a couple from Japan. And we had, we had to look at w not what our favorites were, but what was making an impact. And, you know, by then bands like the creation and the pretty things and the move had kind of passed into a little bit more acceptance and appreciation. So we had a blueprint there but uh, when I put that package together, um, and by the way, that package had a sticker uh, uh, on it that said, uh, contains virtually no hits. Um, <laughs> uh, and that was both a joke and a challenge. I came up with a list based on what I thought was important with some personal taste. I then ran that by three people at Rhino who told me where I was so wrong in many instances. Then I brought in people like Alec Palau, who'd furthered the Nuggets box and who'd done most of the reissues for Ace and you know had a deep knowledge, and brought in Mike Stacks, who runs Ugly Things, the number one fanzine for Garage and 60 Psychedelia. Um, I brought them in to critique my list mercilessly. Then we came up with another draft and bounced it around. That all culminated at, in a night at my house where I brought 10 fans, collectors, people that I had um, connected with that had an experience with this, had a passion for it, and we had a long argument, and we only changed about 10 or 15 songs, but that 10 or 15 is where it went from being good to great. Uh, uh, and that package did incredibly well for a package that comprised kind of nothing most people had ever heard of. I mean, it was a year right. after Wes Anderson had put Making Time and Rushmore and some of those things had found themselves into uh, um, cover versions by bands like Cheap Trick. But that, that set could have been much more highly subjective. We had a very, it was like a writer's room. You have a lot of angry, difficult, disagreeing, grumpy conversations to really give people the best experience and watch your own personal taste and watch your own ego. And that for me, it's a great question because it's an example of where craft beat out art and in the end art won. That's awesome. Got it. Awesome. Gary, um, I, I want to thank you for taking time to sit down with us. Is there, do, do you have a website? Do you have anything you want to promote? Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to drive our listeners to? Um, I would love to endlessly promote uh, 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 my untrammeled glory, power, and accumulation of wealth. But really, I think what's more important here <laughs> is that people, if people want to engage with me through your site or that people 
uh, get this understanding of what makes what I think makes good curation, and we're all part of this. That I uh, that I kind of change the landscape, or or offer an idea uh, that alters that landscape, so that we move more people from being casual consumers um, to fans or people that see that music can have a deeper meaning or provide them with a greater experience when somebody does a good job uh, in the same way that the record store clerks, the disc jockeys, um, uh, the journalists, and uh, the people like ourselves work hard to convince people rather than insisting they like something when they do a good job and put their ego aside without disengaging their passion that's what I want people to become conversant with. So I hope that doesn't sound too soft and fuzzy, but that's the reason I wanted to be on the podcast. No, not at all. I, I, this, to me, this was personally just, it was fascinating to put a face and a real person behind what I think a lot of people, unfortunately, think there's nothing to a playlist. There's nothing to a list. It was just... Somebody woke up and said, let's slap together our greatest hits for Cheap Trick, and here you go. And, and that's not what this is about, and, and no, I'm, me, I'm, I love that. Let me add one thing. I mean, uh, I always say the word curator is a scary word for me because it used to imply people that worked at museums who probably uh, are now liking that the world's pa words passed into to, uh, healthier conversation. It doesn't mean somebody that takes something and stuffs and mounts something and and looks through fine glasses, they take something from the past and make it alive. Uh, one of our mottos at Rhino also was, we collect records so you don't have to. You don't have time to listen to 20 <laughs> albums. You don't have time to know a genre. You trust us to give you an exposure to that, and we hope that it may change your life. And uh, that's what it's all about. That's awesome. Gary, again, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a fascinating yeah. discussion. Fascinating. Thank you for always, having me. Always great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It always is. Um, Jay, thanks for um, tracking down and bringing Gary on. Uh, I can tell you as a music fan, that was just fascinating, listening to him discuss yeah what goes into like creating those iTunes essentials and, and, and yeah. everything that he worked on. I mean, it was just, it, I guess all of a sudden I realized there is significant effort put into those. It's not just, yeah, it's yeah. not just let's create a greatest hits and pick 10 songs and done. We've done it in 10 minutes. I mean, there was, there's research put into that stuff. Absolutely. You know, when I put together a playlist, and, and I know we all have our own playlists on our uh, iPods or, or whatever, um, I have some that I've built for 10 years, but they're my favorite tracks, not necessarily, you know, something that, you know, if I put together my favorite cheap trick list and send it to you, I'm sure yours would be slightly different because we have a different take on what songs move us. But what he said that really stuck with me was, when you're talking about curation and discovery for him to put together a playlist, he doesn't just go by his favorites. In fact, that he tries not to go by his favorites. Exactly. He goes by airplay chart position. You know, is the song in a live set? He looks at, you know, hits packages and to see what, you know, other people think he looks at, you know, the blogs and you know, online media and then he also looks at something, you know, like what, what tracks are being covered by other artists. And those are a lot of things that I just wouldn't have thought of uh, when putting together certainly one of my playlists. But that's what makes Gary so good at what he does, you know, putting together box sets back in the day. And also, you know, the iTunes original or not originals, the iTunes essentials and uh, World Of and some of those, they were so well done. But, you know, what I... I mentioned to him during the, the show was that I really appreciated the fact that I could see one of his playlists on iTunes and say, Oh, you've got this power pop thing, but you know, you don't have this song. And he would say, well, why, why, why do I need that song? And you would tell him, and if it was compelling the next week, <laughs> it would be in the playlist. Yeah. So I love the fact that he's open-minded too. And I just thought that was a fantastic discussion. Yeah. It was just, uh, you know, he's clearly a guy I would love to sit down and, and, and have coffee with because you're right. You could just, 
I, I can feel his um, his knowledge, his passion, the depth of commitment he puts into this stuff. It was just it was just amazing, and and yeah. you know it 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 paints a whole new light. And and I'm not saying because I don't know, I don't know how much effort all the different services put into their playlists. But if they're doing it at this level, I'm extremely impressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed listening to our conversation with Gary. And, um, you know, if you've got any any questions related to playlists and curation and algorithms, leave us a note. We'll, we'll get back in touch with Gary. Yeah, absolutely. All right, until next week. And I don't know, do we have a special guest next week? Yeah, I think we do. I can't remember. I think remember. we do. I can't remember. We, well, it'll be a surprise for all of us. Until next week, <laughs> we're out of here. Take care, everyone. All right, see ya. Bye.